permission from my elders to speak. Thank you. Um, my name is Baba Greg, and I'd like to welcome you all to the Alkiba Line Village. This here is Germany Brown, the youngest black belt in the Alkiba Do martial arts system. Let's give him a hand. He's been doing this since he was a little boy, and my son, who's two years old, was supposed to come and apprentice with him tonight, but he's running a little late. I'm gonna have to call his ride and see what's up with that. But anyway, um, thank you, Germany. If you will set a little bit of a drum beat. Um, Alkibaline is an ancient word for the continent of Africa from the research of Dr. Joseph Benyakinen. And so, in the name, translation, this is basically an African village. In an African village, before an important proceeding like the one that's getting ready to happen tonight takes place, there's always the pouring of libations. The pouring of libations is a very important and central part of the community gathering because we have to ensure that we remember from whence we came. So none of us got here by ourselves. Our parents came from parents who came from parents who came from parents, 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 parents. And we must remember those whose shoulders we stand on. So I have some water that symbols life, or symbolizes life, that I will use to pour libations into this cup. When I say the name of the ancestor, that I'm bringing up for us to remember. You all, if you feel comfortable, can say Ashe. Those of you who don't, there's no pressure. Uh, we won't kick you out, but you will have the benefit of the others who said Ashe and welcome those spirits in with us. So I'm gonna start in antiquity and I'm going to pour a libation to one of my favorite figures in the history of Kemet, known as Hatshepsut. Not only because at that time history didn't have many examples of women leadership, but by all accounts, Hatshepsut was just supposed to be a placeholder while the young person was waiting to become of age to take the throne. But more than just holding that place, Hatshepsut proceeded to expand the economy by exporting um, frankincense and myrrh from the land of Punt and transplanting that over into Kemet, and it became a huge crop for them. And so, because of her vision and ability and wherewithal as a pioneer, I want to pour a libation to her and say, Ashe. And then I want to bring it up to a more recent period in history. Poor libation to one of my personal heroes, although I didn't get to meet him personally. I feel like I got to know him because when I turned 19, I started going to the Detroit Public Library and getting every DVD that I could find with his name on it. He's on my hoodie. He represented what I was going through in my life at that time, a transformation from one set of choices to another. And Malcolm X was so committed to the choices that he made it is said that he was like the Pope. I think one of the FBI, somebody said something like that, comparing him to clergy or someone who they deem holier than holy. And so for his like serious commitment to being the best self that he could be, but being definitely on the case for the race and laying the foundation of the work that is occurring that we'll hear about today. We'll pour a libation to him and we'll say, Ashe. And then last, but by no means least, I like to pour a final libation to someone who I've mentored, who was my mentor here at Alkibalan Village. His name is Elder Dagamba Huru. Elder Huru was a big fella. And so he went into a room, he didn't make a lot of noise, he didn't do a lot of fussing unless it was really required. But he was a gentle giant of sorts in ways where he studied and became a scholar. And he taught those of us who were interested lessons in African history from antiquity all the way up to the present time. 
And we did things like learn to read and write the meta nature and interrogate why certain metrics were used for certain words over other choices and all kinds of very enlightening experiences. And so for the example that he provided to me, I pour a libation to him and we say, Ashe. Ashe. Now at this time, I'd like to open it up for everybody in the audience, for anybody who you want to remember, who you want to ask to join us, you want to call out their name, it could be somebody in your family, it could be a famous person, whomever. Let's do that at this time. Ronald Haynes, Alina Ward. Ashe. Maroon Ashe. 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 And so we know we could call names, right? All night, tomorrow too. And we wouldn't call them all. But we'll pour one final libation to bring it to a full circle. Because we believe that time is interconnected. And so in that belief, the ancestors in the womb are one. So we'll pour a libation to those unborn for the great works that they'll do to continue the struggle for the liberation of our people. We say Ashe. 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 All right. Thank you all. So having done that part, that very important part, now we can get ready to begin. So again, welcome to our Kibalon Village. A brief history of this space is it was founded in 1978 by Marvis Cofield and a group of black belt martial artists who figured out that they were being exploited by the martial arts industry to be gladiators. Black fighters fighting each other for nothing but trinkets and trophies while others raked hundreds of thousands of dollars into their communities from that activity. And so they said, nope, we're not doing that. Let's ally all of us who are fighting each other at these tournaments and let's form our own martial arts team and let's go beat all of them. Mm. And so they did, but it wasn't that easy. It was some steps along the way that they had to take, but they took those steps. They jumped through the hurdles and that was 1978. It is 2023, 45 years of lineage have occurred since then. And so this is a testament to resistance, uh, self-determination, and just doing what needs to be done. And so I think that this is a beautiful place to have the conversation that we're having today because it sounds like those themes are all wrapped up in there. Um, I'm not gonna go on too much longer. I wanna pass the microphone now to Brother Ikemba, who will introduce our speaker this evening. I want to ask permission for my elders uh, to speak. Oh, free to land. land. Free to land. land. Free to land. land. By any means necessary. Greetings, greetings, greetings. It's good to be in the presence of comrades on this Asada Liberation Day. Ashe. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Ikemba. I am an organizer with the Detroit chapter of the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement and the Detroit chapter of the National Jericho Movement. So I've been asked to introduce our fellow comrade and struggle. Really, it's kind of hard to, to formulate words because uh, Bob is so about the work and about our people, right? About the people, right? Um, Jalil Mutakim, really just, I'm excited for tonight because of what we're going to receive, right? A charge to continue the work that's been going on for so long. You know, Baba is a Black Panther veteran, Black Liberation Army veteran, former political prisoner, POW, prisoner of war, was behind the walls doing the work right, for almost 50 years. 
right? Doing the work. A pillar in the Black Liberation Movement, a pillar in the New African Independence Movement. I can remember I was telling a story years ago. I had bought a whole bunch of copies of We Are Our Own Liberators. Because right, sometimes it was hard to find solid analysis, especially around the New African Independence Movement, right? I mean, we had um, things from Baba Chokwe, Yaki, Amari Obadeli, right? And then I got my hands on, you know, as I started to learn about uh, po our political prisoners and prisoners of war writings, I got my hand on We Are Our Own Liberators, started passing, buying them and passing copies out to people, right? I don't quasi, <laughs> you remember, I mean, people still ask, you know, for copy, like, do you still have any more copies? I'm like, you know, go to Baba Jaleel's website and cop one, right? But it's for the liberation of all people, all oppressed people, right? And we can see that one for the work um, it continues to do with the National Jericho Movement for the freedom of, you know, political prisoners, prisoners of war, especially here at Turtle Island. It's a formation that he helped co-found it with a lot of our other, uh, some revolutionary leaders. Um, with the spirit of Mandela, the People's Senate, which that he's going to be uh, talking about tonight, right? It continue to do the work, which is an inspiration because Sometimes, you know, I hear some of my peers say, you know, what would we do if, what would it be like if somebody like Malcolm X was still alive? Or Martin Luther King Jr. We have a lot of our freedom fighters still here with us, still doing the work, right? And I would have to, you know, I would be amiss because we have some in the audience. I know it's not about you, but Mama Neb, we say thank you, I know. But, but we have them still here with us, right? So we have to take that as motivation and inspiration to get that guidance and wisdom from us. So, you know, I would like you all to just, you know, be engaged tonight, you know, ask questions, listen, but take that inspiration and let us continue to do the work. Ashe? Ashe. So with that, Baba Jalil, or I don't know if anybody else is next. I'm sorry, I don't know the, uh, okay. All right. So with that, we'll bring up Baba Jalil. Assalamu alaikum. Peace. Pause. Habagani. Jumbo. Harin. Papin. Guten Tag. Or Fredin. Let me see. Shalom for those who are that extraction. Um, whatever your native language is, I want to greet you in peace and solidarity. Right? It's important that we speak to the world. Right? as much as we possibly can. Because the struggle that we have to engage in here, in these United States, will require the support of the world in order for us to be free. Uh, why do I say that? How do we get to this place where we are today? How does the world, how did it create this situation that we end today in this world? And as far as my history and land life, we can go back to, a, to contemporary times and understanding that, I have to go back to what's on the board right now, right? To 1493, Papal Bull by Alexander VI, right? Called the Doctrine of Discovery. Why is that important? Because it started, initiated the conditions for which we are here today. The doctrine of discovery by this guy named Alexander, right, told the Portuguese and the Spanish to traverse the world and conquer anyone or anyone or anything, and I say thing, 
right? Because they destroyed some in inanimate objects as well, right? In the process to rule the world, right? Anything and everything. And that's the reason why we don't have the Incas today. That's why we don't have the, uh, the uh, Tianos today, or the Arawaks, right? Natives in this country have been decimated by genocide, right? And their sovereignty. The conquistadors, that's what this is, a picture of, right? And they're slaughtering, genocidal slaughtering of the Incas right? around the world. This is what they did to create the dominance of the Vatican and the idea of the Christian religion to conquer the world, all right? That's where it began, 1493. Go read the Doctrine of Discovery and see what it, see what it says, all right? See what it says. That's what they did, including the enslavement of African people. This is where it initiated from. And it's important that we understand that. Because in order for us to deal with the issues that we have to contend with today, we have to know that history. We have to know that history. And this is what they don't teach us in schools. Right? They don't teach us our true history. That's why uh, Carter G. Wilson wrote the book, what? The Miseducation of the Negro. Still being miseducated. And so we have the conquistadores and the Portuguese and the Dutch and the English and the Spanish going around the world conquering nations, discovering people. Hmm? Make sense of that of me. Make that some kind of sense of that for me. There is none. It don't make any sense. And that's the point that we have to get to today. Right? The things that we are confronting today is based upon lunacy. And I'll get to that and explain that in a minute. And so we had the Atlantic slave trade, a result of 1493. Right? The Spanish, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the English, all engaged in it. Right? All engaged in it. And the process from which we have this wealth in this country right now began here, off our backs, right? And the decimation and dis, uh, 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 genocides of natives, indigenous. My grandmother was indigenous, Muscogee from uh, Alabama, Muscogee Creek from Alabama, right? My grandfather was a Jamaican, right? He said they, they said he was a maroon, okay? That's maybe where I got my fighting spirit from. As a matter of fact, my, my grandmother came to me and said, I'm coming to tell you, say, that's right, I'm going to tell you this story. Right before I was going to be paroled from uh, San Quentin, all right, oh, if you didn't know, I did 49 years inside prison, okay, in penal slave system, all right. So right before I was getting paroled from California to be shipped to New York, my grandmother came to visit, all right. She says, listen, I'm going to tell you why you are the way you are. She came with her son, my Uncle Joe, right, one of my favorite uncles. And I looked at Uncle Joe, Uncle Joe said, be quiet, this is to your grandma. Oh, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. So grandma said, listen, here you are, right? She knows, she said, the grandfather came from Jamaica. She always asked me, she said, do you know who the Maroons are? I said, yeah, but I grandma, I know who the Maroons are. Okay, the grandfather was Maroon. He came from Jamaica, he went to Georgia, and he got into trouble. He left Georgia, he went to Alabama, he met his wife, but he got into trouble. Right. And then he moved to Louisiana and he changed his name. He said, what did he change his name to? He changed his name to Bottom. He said, I ain't got nothing, I'm on the bottom, here I am in the bottom, change my name to Bottom. That's how we got our name. I said, okay, cool, right? And we got Bottoms all over the world. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do. We got Bottoms all over, at least all over the United States. Because my great-grandma and my great-grandfather had 18 children, right? right? 18 surviving children, they had 20, four, but 18 survived. My grandfather was the 17th. Okay, so here she goes telling me, here you are. And when she said my grandfather's getting in trouble, you know, the implication was, mm-hmm, back in them days, right? 
So here you are, going around this country, getting in trouble, and changing your name. Just like your great grandfather. Okay. So that's the story, right? That's how I got my name. I changed my name to Jilla Muta King. Right? When I uh, took my Shahada, and became Muslim. Right? Life circumstances changes the reality. Right? And it informs you, raise your consciousness, and hopefully inspires you to take action. That's what we're going to talk about today. Okay. And so, 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution. They won't ever give up on enslaving people. They continue to enslave people. 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution says what? These enslaved and voluntary servitude except what? Well, wait a minute. Except as punished for a crime where uh, one have been duly convicted within the United States or its jurisdiction. It's 1865. The end of chattel slavery and the beginning of penal slavery. We have slavery in this country right now and we're silent about it. We ain't saying nothing. We're sending our kids to slaves. How I know? I was there. 50 years fighting these people. The exception clause. And we got a campaign going on. We're going to talk about it in a minute concerning that. All right. But we have to build. Right? As Asada says, we have a duty to fight. And we have what? A duty to win. Obligation. 14th Amendment. I'm trying to give you a directory of history of our, our resistance and struggle. Right? How we get to where we are today. So now they released or they emancipated about 3 million African people. What are they going to do with them? Right? You can't send them all back into penal slavery, although they changed the law, right? like the black codes, right? Jim Crow, creating a situation from which we can ensure that these people go back into a system of slavery. All right? So what did they do? Came up with the 14th Amendment. Right? Fourteen minutes is meant for naturalization, right, and due process. Right? Uh, if they violate your law, you're gonna make a fourteenth amendment allegations that your 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 rights has been violated. Right? Due process and, and a bunch of other stuff. But more important is the naturalization. So when it came up to the fourteenth amendment, they say we're gonna naturalize these Africans. We never had a choice in the matter. It was imposed upon us. You understand what I'm saying? It was imposed upon black people, African people in this country. That from now to this date, on this date right here, in 1867, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, we're going to establish the 14th Amendment and impose citizenship on these Africans. We never had a plebiscite vote. We never had an opportunity to determine whether we want to go back to Africa, establish our own homeland, or be a citizen in the United States. Now I say establish your own homeland, it's based upon some kind of foundation for that to happen. What is that foundation? During the Civil War, a general by the name of Sherman, Tukum Tuc and Sherman, put out a field order number 15. Now field order number 15 is like an executive order from the president when the general issue it. And it stated that from St. St. Carolina, St. John South, to the Florida Basin will be controlled by these emancipated slaves. Right? And they had the Union officers to make sure they were protected, these emancipated slaves. And what did they begin to do? They began to govern themselves. They started establishing what we call a Freedmen Bureau throughout that territory, throughout that area. Started to create a civilization and governance for themselves. Right? Along came the uh, uh, Hayes Tilden Compromise. Buchanan, Buchanan uh, B. Hayes had won the presidential election, the electoral votes. But this guy named uh, 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 Samuel Sam, Yeah. What was that again? Samuel Jason. Yeah, 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 that guy. <laughs> He won the Confederate vote. Yeah, Tilden. 
right? And they had to have to have a compromise. And the compromise was this. Brother behaves, you can take the presidency, but you have to remove the, the troops from the territory. You know what that started? 100 years of lynching. 100 years of lynching. Right. Because remember, the Confederates became who? Ku Klux Klan. All right, so they removed the troops, and what happened? The Klan, the Confederates, began to terrorize black people. That's created the first exodus out of the South to the North and the West. 14th Amendment. Right? Imposed upon us. We never had the opportunity to determine whether we wanted to go back to Africa, establish our own homeland, which we were trying to do, right? Or become citizens. And we can't say that we became citizens, right? Because right, they always tell us when we're second class. How are you going to be second class to anything? Either you're whole or you're not. You're going to be sometime pregnant, or maybe pregnant. <laughs> what? Come on now. It is A or it is not. And for us, it has always been is not. And so, 15th Amendment. It's another joke. Another joke where they allowedly had black men able to vote. Not black women, not women in general, but men. And included black men. But they set up all kinds of barriers to prevent the, the black vote. Right? It's a farce. It's a lie. Just as they said, 13th Amendment, they ended slavery. It's a lie. We're going to talk about that. The lie. Y'all remember that? What are they telling us? They're not going to change. They're not going to change. They have not changed the last 600 years. Why do you think they're going to change now? Huh? We got to get organized people because they ain't playing no games. They're not playing any games. They're getting prepared. Man, they're getting prepared. Now, you know damn well if it was black, brown, indigenous people storming Congress, there have been bodies all over the Congressional Plaza. Why not them? Why not them? Because they're on the same page. They may not like what they did. They may not like what they did, but they're on the same page. Democrats, Republicans, they don't make no damn difference. Right? On the same page. What's the page? White supremacy. Capitalist imperialism. You see what they did? What was they up there for? To nullify the black vote. If you nullify the black vote, you're also nullifying black power. If you're nullifying black vote, you're nullifying black power, you're nullifying black people. That's what they want to do. They want to nullify black people. 15, 20 years ago, there was a big outcry in our communities that the black man is an endangered species. How did the black man become an endangered species? Shutting up black men and killing black men had to be more than that. It has to be systemic, institutionalized, planned. <laughs> oh, planned, planned. They've been doing it for ages. You heard about your Eileen, Eileen, and the other African cities and towns. Tulsa, wiped off the planet. That's what they do. These are hard facts, yo. And we may have our heads in the sand, like ostrich. The ostrich send them. Right? Yeah. And so what happened with the, what happened with the Doctor of Discovery? 
the Monroe Doctrine. It morphed into the Monroe Doctrine, a doctrine whereby the United States says with their own exceptionalism, exceptional, American exceptionalism, they are accepting themselves from any other people or any other nation, state in the country, in the world. Exceptionalism, the Monroe Doctrine, said that they, on the Western Hemisphere, that anywhere that the United States goes in the Western Hemisphere, we talk about Latin American, and Caribbeans, and et cetera, right? They control it, any other Western country cannot. So not the Dutch, not the Spanish, not the Portuguese, not the English, not the Germans, can mess with their areas. American exceptionalism, and what it has morphed. It has morphed this exceptionalism so they can go all around the world and colonize people. Same thing as that papal bull. Same thing. It's doctrine of this country. All right? And this is how we began the, the understanding of imperialism and empire building. So as you know, that's what the United States is, right? It's an empire. It's a corporate empire. Let's talk about that. All right? So for black people, and understanding how we've been traumatized by the system of white supremacy, right? El Haj Malisha Baz asked the question. What's the question? Who taught you to hate yourself? Well, we are a people who originally came to this country, or really brought to this country, were the Ibus, the Fulanis, the Mandinkas, the Hoffa, all kinds of African tribes and nations. And we messengenated, messengenated with the Cherokees, the Seminole, the Creek, but not only that, the Dutch, the English, the Spanish, the Portuguese. Black people speak all these languages all around the world. We can speak to the planet of the ills of the planet. We should have the, the spirit, the determination, the understanding of our relationship to this planet. A race to history. Our history has been built around us. And they try to exclude us from that, wipe us out of history. We have to claim it. We have to claim our history. We have to claim our history of what? Resistance against white supremacy, resistance against capitalist exploitation, exploitation. And now it's Malik Shabazz, one of our greatest leaders, right? I think there's only one leader that I feel that's even had more profound effect that we don't give credit to, is Marcus Garvey. All right, the flag red, black, and green, Marcus Garvey. The building of the, the kind of uh, institutional development of organizing. He organized in America. He organized in Latin America. He organized in the Caribbean. He organized in Africa. And he organized in England. You're near. All right? Yeah. That's what we got to do again. All right? We have to broaden our capacity to organize ourselves into an international foundation. Al Hajmi Shabazz said that. Did he not? Then he said, if we can continue to keep our movement within the civil rights, the parameters of the civil rights, you give them the, the federal government the opportunity to determine yay or nay, whatever the issue is. But if we take ourselves to the international community, it's no longer a civil rights issue, now it's a human rights issue. It's a human rights issue. All right? And we're bringing the world to our issue, to our cause. Because it's human rights. All right? And that's what we're doing today. Again. Uh-oh. Turn that last one. Come on, boy. And then here. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Thank you, man. That's my, my fiance, Valerie. 
wherever I go, I got to have them. <laughs> Yeah, civil rights, human rights. Now, let me say something about human rights. I'm going to just read something about human rights. This is out of my book called We Are Own Liberators, all right? If we don't do it, and nobody else will. Do you agree to that? If we don't liberate ourselves, who's going to do it? Huh? We have to. The Declaration of Human Rights all right, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states this. Article 15, everyone has a right to a nationality. Everyone. And no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality or denied the right to change his nationality. Human rights. That's why we have to take ourselves to human rights. All right? What's our nationality? Talking about black people. All right? What has happened to us in this country? We've been called everything except for children of God. Right? From a coon to the N-word right, to a Negro. And what did we do? We accepted it. We adopted the names given to us by others instead of naming ourselves as a nation or as a people. We have not done that. There's a process of moving towards that ideal for our goal and objective but you have a human right to do so, despite them want, not wanting you to do so. All right? And so, in the process of building toward that human rights, we decided it was necessity, and I want to give you some preliminary history about the International Tribunal. Okay. Part of my imprisonment was to continue to survive prison. And the manner from which I continued to survive prison was to continue to fight. Right? My continuing to fight was my sanity and understanding they had a captured political prisoner in a slave plantation. And I refused to work in industry. I refused to work in the uh, uh, mess hall. Right? In areas where I know they are get their best work for pennies on the dollar. I refuse to lock me up right? for weeks, months at a time. But I continue to organize. I organized the first United the first petition to the United first petition to the United Nations by prisoners that was heard. Right? I organized the first major march, support march to Washington DC as part of the petition campaign to the United Nations. Right? It was supported by people all around the world. Right? I organized the first national newspaper called Arm the Spirit. National Prisoners newspaper while I was inside. In 1998, I organized myself and Sophia Bukhari and uh, uh, Baba Herman Ferguson, organized the Jericho Movement, 1998. It still exists today. Jihad Abdul Mumin, one of my dearest comrades, is now the chairman. Done an excellent job with Jericho Movement. Jericho Movement is for the building of support for political prisoners. Uh, Valerie works for the Northeast Political Prisoners Coalition. And Kamal Siddiqui, international campaign to free Kamal Siddiqui. <laughs> this is the kind of work that we do, all right? Why do we need to fight for our political prisoners? Because they're the best of us. They are the ones who want to put their lives on the line, put their liberty on the line, because their love for their people, we want to fight. We can't abandon them. I'm here too, man. come on. <clears throat> I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Free all our political prisoners. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Traumatized. We all are. 
All right. Go ahead, man. We'll go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Charles Harris. <clears throat> and sometimes <clears throat> I think about those who left behind. And we gotta fight for them. All right? We gotta fight for Kamal Siddiqui. You don't know the story of Kamal Siddiqui? Let me tell you the story of Kamal Siddiqui. Former Black Panther Party member, a veteran member of Black Panther Party in the Black Liberation Army. <clears throat> Did time. Got out, and the FBI jumped on him. Why? Because he is the father of Asada Shakur's daughter, Kikuya. And they want him to trap her off out of Cuba. He refused. They gave him a bogus charge he's in prison today for refusing. Imam Jamil Alameen, some of you may know him as Rap Brown, in prison today for a crime they know he did not commit. 80 years old. 80 years old. They know he didn't commit. How they know he didn't commit? Because somebody confessed. Same identity profile, everything. The Imam is still there. That's my Imam. We have to fight for his release. All right? Veronica Bowers, former member, veteran member of Black Panther Party, Black Liberation Army, did his time. Given parole, was granted parole on his way out the front door. Escorted by the superintendent, got a phone call from Anthony Gonzalez, who was attorney general, and said, don't release him. Ten years ago. Almost 20 years. Time fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got to fight for them. And that's why Jericho Moore was put together. We got to have love for our people. We got to. <clears throat> and so, in 2018, I was sent to the box again, SHU. Right, for teaching black history. Um, a proof program, a proof of class. And I was teaching from 1861 to 1966. 1966 was the time when the Black Panther Party came into existence, October 1966. So you had to talk about that. If you're going to talk about 1966, you got to talk about the Black Panther Party. If you don't, you, you don't know your history. All right. I started talking about the Black Panther Party. You know what they did? Shut the program down. Shut it down. Put me in SHU, Special Housing Unit. Four months, lock me down. Yeah, for teaching a class that was approved. Saying I was trying to organize the prisoners to become militants, to become revolutionaries. Yeah, they right. <laughs> so I accepted that, right? So I had a, a classroom full of JDs, Bloods, Crips, gangsters, gangsters, all right? And I was changing their minds, raising their consciousness, getting them to understand their responsibility in their community, the origins of their organization. They don't want you to do that. They don't want you to raise people's consciousness, not even inside or outside. You know what I'm saying? They said they locked me down. And I said, brothers, I want my brother, Jihad Abdul Mubet, chairman of Jericho, my brother, comrade, uh, Sekou Odinga, right? Make dua for Sekou, inshallah. Make a prayer for Sekou. He's hospitalized. All right. Once this history comes out, y'all going to be amazed what he championed. We got heroes, living heroes. And we don't respect them. We don't give them their due. All right. And so I was in the box. I said, uh, Jihad, we need to uh, get the international jurors to come back to the United States. All right. We had did so uh, earlier, uh, 1981, based upon the UN campaign that I organized when I was in, Green, when I was in uh, San Quentin. And they came, raised the issues of political prisoners, 
they wrote a report that says, yes, the United States does, in fact, have political prisoners. All right. They came and did interviews with certain people inside. Okay. <clears throat> so I said, we need to bring them back. And they said, okay, we'll bring them back, but this time we're going to include the issues of genocides. Fine. Right? So we did. October 22nd to the 25th, we had the International Tribunal. It was held at the Malcolm X Betty Shabazz uh, Research and Learning Center, I think that's what it's called, Educational Center. All right? Three days. Nine international jurors, human rights organizations, and the United Nations representatives. They heard 30 witnesses, right? boxes of documents. And they determined the United States is guilty of genocide against black, brown, and indigenous people. Silence, crickets, nothing. If China was found guilty of genocide against the Uyghurs by an international steam, international body, it's been all over the news. Right? Any other country, not this country. Five charges, health inequities. We know we'd be having some difficulties in our community with health. There should be universal health care in this country, there's not. There's reasons why. But even if there were, or even if they're, because they're not, especially black, brown, indigenous people get the worst health care, if any health care at all. I'm fighting for insurance myself right now. They took right away. So I gotta go, go jump through some hoops. Okay. It's real. Okay. Health inequities. We have the greatest amount of asthma, diabetes, heart ailments, liver, kidneys, you name it. The indigenous, the brown, the black suffers the most. Right? Environmental racism. The communities where we live in, many of us live in, like what happened in Michigan, uh, Flint, the water, right? Uh, uh, Katrina, some years back, the floods. Who was devastated? Environmental racism. That also caused the conditions of the health inequities. You think this is a, a happenstance? This is just by chance? The our communities in slums and ghettos? Majority? No, it's planned, it's designed. That's right. right, redlining, that's a cobble of the banks for their own profits. Mass incarceration. Hmm, let's talk about that. Mass incarceration. Why? Why is it the United States that the, has the most prisoners or incarcerated workers in any other industrialized nation in the world. Why? Does the American population make more crime than any place else on the planet? I don't think so. Probably, well, let me change that. Let me modify that. Yeah, yeah they make crimes that are offensive to God. The kind of crimes they make. Mass incarceration. Right? It's genocidal. We have young kids going to prison into the slave system. As I did, 19, didn't get out till I was 68. Right? Lucky for me, I had a child in the womb before I went in. Right? When I got out, the first time I was with my child in the streets, she was 50 years old. <clears throat> Trauma. We suffer trauma. We have to face that kind of trauma. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But we face trauma. We got to face trauma. Okay. What we experienced. We have been navigating 400 years of white supremacy. You don't think we as a people been traumatized? Huh? We allow them to call us and we accept them being named Negroes. Whatever that is. Oh, yeah, that's Spanish for black. <laughs> Traumatized. 
What, 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 what did he say? Hmm. Traumatized. This kind of self-hatred perpetuated upon us that we have normalized as if it's normal. It's not normal, people. It's abnormal. The way we are living in this social order. It's not normal. It's abnormal. But we have been indoctrinated to the point that we have normalized the abnormal. Oh. You got it? Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Boom. See? Okay. Oh, all right, all right, all right. Okay, so let me wind let me wind down. Um, Cause we have some 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 questions and answers right too. I like questions and answers. All right. Um, so we've been traumatized, all right, to the point where we have to move ourselves from a, a colonial situation, the colonial mentality, the colonized mind. This is what we have to address. All right, mass incarceration resulting in decimation of our population. I'm gonna sound like a rap right there. All right, mass incarceration is called the decimation of our population. True. Because those are the years that people who were able to reproduce have been able to do so. The black population is stagnant. In the last 15 years, 50 years, we have no, there's no growth in the black population from 11 to 13 percent. 50 years. Every other population has grown in numbers. Not black people. It has not. Genocides. All right? This is not the first time the issue of genocide has been raised. All right? That's four. All right? Police murder of our people. State-sanctioned terror. All right? So we suffer with impunity, with impunity. Uh, a couple of, about six months ago, a young man was killed in Chicago. I think it was Chicago, right? Shot at 100 times, hit 60 times. 60 times. One bullet can kill a person. Why would they switch cheese to this young brother? To commit terror in the community. This is what we'll do to you. Right? Psychological warfare. Right? I was talking to a brother Imhotep uh, on the way over here. Right? And he was talking about what made the move go down and so forth and so on. So I explained to him one of the areas was this crack. Imported cocaine. Who imported cocaine? The CIA government. We know it. It's chemical warfare in our communities, creating this crack cocaine. And it destroyed generation. Targeted our community for chemical warfare. But because our heads are in the sand of Austin syndrome, we don't see it. We don't understand what's going on. It is deliberate, it is planned, it's purposeful. What they're doing. All right? And so, those five charges health inequities, police murder of our people, mass incarceration. Uh, environmental racism and mass incarceration. Did I say that? Oh, political prisoners. <laughs> and we talked about that a minute ago, yeah. And our political prisoners. All right, those are the five issues. The United States have found guilty of genocides. And so what we decided to do, we gotta remove ourselves from harm. We gotta divorce ourselves from a system that is organized for our decimation for our genocides. Now keep in mind, it's not the first time this issues of genocide has been raised. December 17th, 1951, about four months after I was born, three months after I was born, the great Paul Wilberson, some of you may have heard of him. The great W.D. Du Bois, some of you may have heard of him. All right? William Patterson, some of you may have heard of him, filed the first petition to the United Nations 
declaring the United States engaged in the genocides. You know what happened? The FBI would not allow Paul Robinson to go to Geneva. And they tried to prevent William Patterson from coming back. We was able to achieve what they attempted to do. We got a verdict. We got a verdict. Right? We need to understand what that means, the impact that it has, not only for here, but for around the world. When the world understands the United States has been found guilty of genocide against black, brown, indigenous people, they got no more hold on, on being the, the, the harbinger of uh, human rights. Right? The protector of human rights. They engage in genocides. They're killing us. Slowly but surely. No, it's not the kind of genocide of like the Holocaust, where you crowded up a whole bunch of people and send them to the gas chamber. Not that. Right? This is a slow, deliberate decimation of a population, an ethnic cleansing process. Right? Because they still need us for menial and manual labor, for the most part. Menial and manual labor. Okay. But outside of that, uh, if we don't create our own economic and socioeconomic and political conditions for our survival, uh, they have no plans for us. None. Wake up, people. It's reality. All right. We're having January 6, 2020, uh, or 21, yeah, 21. It's proof of that. They have planning. Right? You heard of Cop City? Yeah. You, heard, you heard of Cop City? Cop City? Yeah, Cop City. Yeah, yeah. They're organizing Cop Cities across the country. And what's the purpose of Cop City? Training the police in urban warfare. They're militarizing the police across the country. In urban warfare. Against who? What are they preparing for? Because they know they're going to create the conditions from which people are going to rise up. They know that. But rather than create the conditions to prevent people from rising up, like equal distribution of wealth, dealing with the issues of poverty and health care, etc., they don't going to do that. They won't. It's not in their corporate interests. What do I mean by that? Hmm. Do y'all know the United States is a corporation? Huh? 28 U.S.C. 3002 15A states the United States is a federal corporation. So when you pledge allegiance to the flag, you're pledging your allegiance to the corporation. Right? Ten years ago, the United States Supreme Court in decisions called People's Action, People's United, made a determination that corporations are people. Huh? Make sense out of that for me. The last stuff don't make any sense. But make sense out of that for me. How do corporations can become people? So now when they say for the people, by the people, they ain't talking about us. They ain't talking about flesh and blood human beings, sentient human beings. They're talking about corporations. For the people, by the people. For the corporations. How can the, that's the only way the Supreme Court can come to that kind of conclusion, that kind of a decision. To understand the government that we are aligned to is a corporation. And that's how they function around the world in the best interest of the corporation, the Iraq war. Right? What was it for? Oil. They murdered one million people in six days. Took them off the planet, one million people, six days. For Exxon, for Exxon, <laughs> for the oil corps. All around the world, this is what they do. Remember the doctrine of discovery? Remember the Monroe Doctrine? Yes. That is, their, that is their agenda. And we are pawns in the game. Pawns in the game. And that's the reason why we have to remove ourselves from a system of genocides. Capitalist imperialism, right? white supremacy, a system of white supremacy, institutionalized white supremacy. In order for white supremacy to have to exist, you have to have a people who are considered to be inferior in order to have superior. And for us, we have normalized that station in life 
for black people, that we're inferior. We may not consciously say that, but we have been indoctrinated to the point where it becomes normalized in our thinking, in our behavior. The thought precedes action, that's right. How you think they determine the fracture, what you're going to do? Right? So if you think like a slave, you're going to act like a slave. Right? Consciously or unconsciously. You're going to toe the line. Right? Instead of stepping out the line. I was in a program the other day with uh, 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 Gwala, Sioux Chief. Right? Uh, Red Cloud, Henry Red Cloud. And that was his argument. We got to stop standing in line. Right? We got to get out of line. Right? As John Lewis, not my favorite person, would say, get in good trouble. We got to get in good trouble for our people. And so what we're doing, we're building what we call the People's Senate. That's how we're moving forward. We're going to remove ourselves from this corporate entity, this settler colonial corporate government, right, and move towards a people's government. One for the people, by the people, by us, for us. We can do it. We have to imagine the beginning of a new dawn of history. People are the motor force in creating history. Is that right? right. People are the motor force in creating history. We are the motor force in creating history. We have to get united. The United States government is based upon, the capitalist person is based upon two principles. Right? Individualism and competition. Without individualism, there is no capitalism. Without competition, there is no capitalism. So what is the opposite of that? Cooperation and unity. That's what we got to be about. We got to build greater cooperation amongst ourselves and each other. So we have built greater unity in the course of building our struggle. All right? We have to. I was like, they're going to maul us over. Maul us over. Make us into a parking lot. <laughs> maul us over. Right? There are all kinds of African graves that have been mauled over. All kinds of uh, indigenous nations and grave sites have been mauled over. That's what they do. All right? For profits. So we're going to build the people's senate across the country. All right? Uh, we're going to build what we call people's assemblies. So we make a determination to ask to what are the issues in our community that has to be addressed. Right? We're going to organize ourselves collectively or for the purpose of addressing those issues. And as we do so, we'll organize the community, more people in the community, to see uh, how we're being empowered with these people's assemblies. And each assembly is going to nominate a person to represent their territory, their area. All right? And this body of senators on a national level, we will decide the issues that need to be addressed for us, real people, fresh and blood people, not the corporations. You have to imagine this. We have to imagine a future where we are empowered and not the corporations. All right. And uh, the meeting the other day, I was talking to, uh, I made the mention, uh, uh, Henry Red Cloud. And he was talking about his people and how they've been. Like I said, my, my great grandmother was Muskogee, Creek Indian, right, out of Alabama. And they was part of, the Muskogee Creeks were part of the Trail of Tears, right, where they were ushered out of Georgia and Alabama into Oklahoma by military escort. All right, take them off their lands. And what does it remind me? Gaza. Gaza. That's what they do. They'll take your land, take your life. All right. Um, one last note uh, before I end. Uh, a couple of years ago, Two years ago, Val and I was in uh, uh, Greece talking about political prisoners, international and symposium on political prisoners. And one thing I told them about their struggles and our struggle, that they will not be free until we are free. 
Hmm. Understand what I just said? The world will not be free until we are free. Why is that? Because we're in the belly of the beast. We're in the belly of the empire. Do you understand the magnitude of that? Do you understand how the world is waiting for us to start cooperating and unifying instead of this individualism and competition, even in the movement? Because we have internalized what we've been indoctrinated. It's part of our purging. We have to decolonize our minds and our thinking. That's part of the process. Right? Fanon made mention the necessity of engaging in violence in order to purge the sense of inferiority. So he said about the Algerians. I'm not promoting that at this point in time. Been there, done that. <laughs> no, no. We have to be able to defend ourselves at all times. Okay. But while we was in Greece and also while I was in Venezuela uh, last year in support of uh, Alex Saab, let me just briefly say about the story of Alex Saab. Alex Saab was, is, is a, a Venezuelan uh, diplomat, right? As you well know, the United States has a, have a, an embargo against Venezuela. And so he's going around the world trying to make partnerships with Venezuela right, for the various needs that they need in their country. The United States kidnapped him. He's in the Florida prison right now. Yeah. Breaking all rules of dip diplomatic uh, uh, laws. So they, was asked, they asked me to come down there to represent, right? And I told them the same thing. I said the same thing in Puerto Rico. You will not be free until we are free. Come in the belly of the beast. And as you well know, empires do not collapse from external forces. History informs that empires are collapsed from internal forces. When the people inside the empire decide no more, when they say no, when they have the courage and the audacity to say no, no more. Right? And so the world is waiting for us. Look all around the world, all around the world, where's the black man? Downtrodden. Australia, New Zealand, Germany, France, England, Africa, Brazil, Caribbean, downtrodden. When we're free, the world will be free. The world will be free. That's why I say, <laughs> we're on our own liberators. Anybody gonna liberate us but us? With that, I say, assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. Now let's keep it going for Jalil Mutakin. Free all political prisoners. You know, this isn't over. You know, we wanted to give the community an opportunity to engage in discussion. So, uh, but at this breaking point, this is an opportunity to get a donation from the crowd for the space that we're in. So again, I think I mentioned to y'all what our Key Line Village does, youth development, um, 24, 365, 24 365, here in this building, serving the community, and like this event in particular, we didn't charge anything or any of that. It's important for us to be able to hold the space for the community, but through cooperative economics, we continue to make this possible. So while we're having this quick moment, while we're doing this, I'm gonna call Sarah up, who's been working hard with me, making sure that we had our audio and everything tight. Um, we got a separate microphone that we're gonna pass around. Sarah, if you could check and make sure that's live, we live? Check in. Oh man, we good. Look like we ready to roll for the community discussion. So I'm gonna put this microphone up, I'm gonna come through the rows, and whatever your heart leads you to do, 
The Cash App Thank You is dollar sign Alkebalon Village, A L K E B U L A N Village. I know I said. Right. Okay, yes. All right, here we go. Let's start the discussion. Uh, Brother Jalil, I know you're probably tired of me asking you questions because I just had you in the car with me two hours asking so many questions, but I got another one. I'm just curious to know uh, what motivated you to um, join the uh, the Black Panther Party, in particular, as well as the um, Black Liberation Army. What 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 was the uh, what inspired you to join the conscious community? Join the conscious community. <laughs> Got a story for you. <clears throat> My mother was a. Um, student of African dance, all right? As a young child, she used to teach my sister and I African dance. And her teacher used to tell her, you're African, all right? You're African. That's how I was raised. I was raised with the understanding I'm of African descent, all right? From my parents, okay? So that's the first thing. I was never a Negro, I never a coon, Another N-word. Last, in fact, the last name that I had, bottom, I had to fight in school, being teased. You know, every, any kind of bottom joke you have, I never heard it. You know what I mean? So that's the kind of attitude that I was raised in understanding resistance. My mom was a member of the NAACP. She used to take us out on, you know, marches and stuff. Okay. I was in juvenile hall, because I was a bad boy, right? And one of the counselors gave me a book, the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I read it. I said, wow, this is profound. Okay. Years later, a few years later, I was um, involved with my comrades. I used to have a, a singing group. We used to be a singing. We used to do up. Back in the days, we had do up groups. So we had a do up group back in the days. Right? Me and my boys, right, growing up. And we used to get them calling, we used to sing. Matter of fact, we was good. All right? San Francisco uh, uh, team competition, right? San Francisco team top, we came in second place. Right? Yeah. So we was good. All right? <laughs> Gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's gone. In the shower, maybe, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, anyway, so my comrades, uh, at, due to a, a parting, I had to leave and go to another part of the California uh, under court mandate. So every once in a while, I used to go back to San Francisco and hang out with my boys. They had since joined the Black Panther Party. Right? In our absence, I was organizing the BSU in my high school. Right, because of our consciousness, right? Uh, I'll give you another story to share with you to show you some of the, some of the dynamics here, right? Nine years old, riding the bus to school, right? Um, and at that time, Jim Crow, you had to ride in the back of the bus, okay? And so, one day, I decided, I don't wanna ride in the back of the bus anymore, I'm gonna ride up front with the white folks, right? Yeah. And so that's what I did. And the bus driver said, take you behind to the back of the bus. Right? And one white woman stood up and said, no. He can sit up here with me. Right? And I did. And when she got off for a bus stop, right, left, right, the bus driver turned around and said, now take your black ass to the back of the bus. And I stood up, looked around and said, if anyone else, anybody else would stand up for me so I can sit up front with the white people. None did. Not one. You know what I did? I went to the back of the bus. But that was a lesson for me at nine years old. Right? There are some people who recognize the, the law is wrong. They have the moral courage to stand up. One person allowed me to sit up front. So I'm always looking for that one person who has the moral courage to stand up for what is right and not be one of the herd, the herd, 
right? Who bow else and acquiesce to the wrong, right? We champion the right. We champion the truth. Okay? That's what we do. And so my boys joined the Black Panther Party. I was hanging out with them. One day I was, uh, we was uh, uh, emptying out the truck for the Panther newspaper, right? A lot of you don't know, the Panther newspaper was to sell 250,000 papers every month. It was the largest black distribution of a newspaper in the country, or black newspaper in the country. Right? It was handed from hand to hand to at least to a thousand, at least to a million people. Right? Monthly, monthly. And that's how we was able to organize our community right? into the chapters that we had. We had five, there was 5,000 Panthers right? across the country. But we made noise. We made noise because we were dedicated. Dedicated. We believed what we were doing. And it was kids. It was a youth movement. No one over the age of 30. Right? I was 16 when I joined the Black Panther Party. 19, 18 when I became recruited to the underground. 19, I was arrested, captured. I didn't get back out until I was 68. You know what I did? Right back where I'm at. Let's go. Go to work. I never stopped working. Never. Even while I was inside. Because I'm still I'm fighting for what is right. right. For what is true. Okay? And so, you asked the question, I hope that gave you the answer, right? What was the means of when I joined the Black Panther Party? Right? That was my trajectory. Okay. Right. Circumstances make men as well as men make circumstances. All right? And we have to understand it between the two. Right? That we can create the circumstances for which we want to live in instead of being hampered by circumstances created by others. So always somebody planning. When are we going to start planning? Because they always plan against us. The whole the system. Down. Listen, there are 740 billionaires in the United States. 740 billionaires. Right? They have accumulated wealth of $6.9 trillion. Accumulated wealth, $6.9 trillion. Between 740 people and corporations. In a population of 330 million. We're complicit in our own oppression by our silence. How in the world we're allowing 740 to rule the world? The world. So for their profiteering and our detriment. Every religion, every religion states that hoarding of wealth is what? A sin. A sin. Hmm. We live in a sinful country. Can they permit the hoarding of wealth? Right? Jesus, he kicked over the, the, the money changers tables, right? For usury. And they say this is a Christian country. Yeah, based upon the doctrine of discovery. This is what we're confronted. This is the mentality, this thinking, this inhuman behavior. White supremacy. <laughs> you know, I got, I, they won't let me get my master's, but I got two bachelor's degrees while I was inside psychology and sociology. All right? And my study in psychology, I was able to get a, a hand of the DSM book, DSM volume six, which is the mandated book of psychology and psychiatrists. Right? And know what it says about superiority complex? The book says it's a mental disorder. Superiority complex is a mental disorder. Not what I'm saying, that's what they say. It's their book. So what is white supremacy? It's crazy. It's a mental disorder. To believe that you're superior to any other people on the planet, White skin privilege, what is that? How are you gonna have a privilege? A privilege to be what, white? What is that? That's our trauma though, because we're allowing it to happen. We're allowing it to happen. 
The struggle for white people, the struggle for white people is to end white supremacy. They got to go to Uncle Bubba and Aunt Jenny to put down that Confederate flag. Right? In order to discover their own humanity. How they're part of the human family. Not superior, a part of. But they rule by violence, demented violence, taking off whole planets, whole populations. History of doing that. From the Incas to the Tianos to the Arawaks to the Africans to continuation today, Palestine. Come on, people. That's where we are today. All right? And I just showed you the origins in our contemporary time, 1493. How it has morphed into the Monroe Doctrine. How it's maintained by the system of corporations. Because the United States and this Supreme Court says are people. Excluding us. I don't think we are. We're the worker bees. That's what we are. Wage laborers. They make exorbitant profits off our labor. Exorbitant profits for free of the penal system. So we got a campaign called 13 Forward. Right? I, just, I don't want to be missed on, on talking about that. Campaign for 13 Forward across the country. And a campaign for the purpose of ending penal slavery in the United States. So far, seven states have changed their, their constitution to remove the language of penal slavery right, and compulsory labor out of their constitution. We're working on two bills in New York right now. There are bills pending in California right now. Go to 13, 134.org and join that campaign. That's something we all can do collectively. right? It's easy for us to do. Join the campaign to end penal slavery, 134.org. 13thforward.org, excuse me, .org, 13thforward.org. Support that campaign, right? Go to spiritofmandela.org, spiritofmandela.org, slash people's center. You can see there'll be a bar that says people's center. Join the campaign to build a people's center. Go to the what, what is it, babe? Freecamel.com. Freecamel.com. K-A-M-A-U. Right? Support the fight to free Kamel. Right? Go to ijam.org. Free the campaign to free uh, uh, Imam Jamil Alameen. Go to the Jericho Movement.org. Learn about Jericho and the work that we're doing for political prisons. We've been doing it for the last 22 years. Right? Go to these websites. Learn these organizations, what they're doing. Doing powerful work. All right? There's many others. All right? But one thing we need to do for certain is stop Cop City. We got to figure out ways how to stop that, or at least prepare for it, because they're preparing. All right? They're institutionalizing fascism. All right? The militarization of the police across this country will end civil rights. For real, for real. All right, and this is their plan. All right? Anybody, anybody else got any questions? Because I can go on and on and on and on. Uh, yes, but. Oh, okay, okay, yes. Opportunity, we'll have. I see you there. We'll have more opportunity to meet. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. Sure, you go ahead. 
And then we have a question in the audience. Peace, y'all. So my name is Val, and I'm from the Free Kamal Siddiqui Committee campaign. So I just want to say, because I, I cannot not say this, it's November 2nd. Aside from the fact that it's my daughter's birthday, she turned 29 today. So shout out to Zawadi, my daughter. But today is also the day that um, our sister Asada Shakur was liberated from prison by her Black Liberation Army comrades <clears throat> and some brothers, some, some um, anti-imperialist um, um, white folks who are part of our struggle and continue to be part of our struggle. So I want to shout out our sister Asada Shakur. She is welcome here. Let's fight to bring home Kamal Siddiqui. Let's fight to bring home Imam Jamal Alami. Let's fight to bring home Ed Poindexter and Mumi Abu Jamal and Reverend Joy Powell and, and, and Lenny Peltier from the African, I'm sorry, from the um, independence, ind indigenous um, independence movement. Um, who am I missing? Jojo Bowens and um, Fred Muhammad Burton. Those are all from the um, Black Liberation Army and um, Black Panther Party veterans. I'm sorry? Luna Hernandez, all our Puerto Rican comrades, free them all. All right, I'll save my I'll save my question. I want to. So uh, welcome. All right. Um, it's an uh, honor to be here and to be able to have a chance to meet you in person and to hear you speak. Uh, my name is Fahad. I'm from New York. One of your slides and, and part of your conversation, uh, one of your slides showed the, the Confederates that still exist, right, and are kind of actually gaining power. And so on one hand, we have this outright fascist force that is growing in the United States. And then we kind of have the centrists, or what get referred to as the centrists, yeah. who are slow genocide. The ones that want to do immediate genocide here, and the ones that want to do slow genocide. And we're really not at a position that we can defeat either one of them. Go on. on one hand, if we uh, don't confront the, the outright fascists, we get liquidated. And at the same time, it is disgusting to think about working with the centrist forces to try to defeat the outright fascists. And especially right now, when it seems like both of those forces internationally are willing to be committed to genocide. How do you think we navigate this moment um, in terms of like how do we build our forces and how do we navigate between these two forces? Okay. okay. I'll tell you three words. <clears throat> I'll tell you three words from Stokely Carmichael, uh, Kwame Torre. Organize, organize, organize. We have to organize, bro. All right. We have to remove from ourselves the indoctrination of individualism right, and competition, even within the movement. We recognize the difficulties that we are confronting and the opposition. We also understand there are contradictions within those oppositions. We have to figure out the ways how to exploit those contradictions to our benefit as they do us, all right? But generally speaking, we have to go to the youth, the next generation, all right? Our struggle is not a sprint. You know, when I was in the, early in my days, I thought we were gonna have revolution in my lifetime. Right, that we're going to win this war, it's going to be over with, and we're going to live happily ever after right, in freedom and liberation in my lifetime. Nuh-uh. Right. This is a marathon. 
right? It's not a uh, sprint. So we have to prepare the next generation to take the baton, right, as we pass it. We've lost a generation of revolutionaries, right? Those are the 60s, right? We are gray hair, not, I, I got an issue with gray hair, all right? <laughs> I'll tell, I don't care who cares. It's, it's my vanity. Right. <laughs> okay. Hey, they took all my youth, right? I gotta come out here and look, young, look old too? Come on. <laughs> anyway, anyway. I like to tell that joke. Right, because it's real. Anyway. Uh, uh, we have to be able to pass it on to the next generation. Right? But in order to do so, they gotta be prepared to take the baton. All right? We're gonna win. Right? Because God and the truth is on our side. I don't care if you believe in God or don't believe in God, right? The truth is on our side. History is on our side, okay? But we've got to understand, we've got to know this history. If we don't know, we're going to continue to make the same errors repeatedly, okay? The Democratic and Republican Party, as you're talking about, right? And the split in between each of them, right? Are Two heads of the same coin, right? Two heads of the same coin, right? No matter if you elect a Democrat or elect a Republican, they're going to maintain the system of white supremacy and capitalist imperialism. So our goal is just to remove ourselves from that, right? We will build a people's senate. Remember, there was only 12 people, I think it was 12 white men that created the United States, right? 12. They imagine this reality. Why can't we imagine a new reality? How come we cannot raise our own humanity, our common humanity, to do that? First of all, we gotta do, we gotta decolonize our mentalities. Right, there's a, a, a old fuckadelic song. Uh, I don't know if y'all know, some of you people never know what fuckadelic is, apartment fuckadelic, right? And they had a song called, Free Your Mind and Your Ass Will Follow. We got to free our minds. We got to free our minds, bro, right? We, we cannot be in a position of, of um, being complicit right? or apathy, being apathetic, right? We have to recognize and believe that we can win and be engaged, engage, right? We talk about people becoming abolitionists, right? You know what ab to, to abolish means? To terminate, to exterminate. We have to be an abolitionist. But we want to expand the word. That's just the issue of the carceral system. We want to abolish anything and everything that dehumanizes, demeans, or degrades the value of black people. Abolish it. If it degrades, dehumanizes, demeans the value of black people, fight against it, yes, white people. Right? In doing so, you fight against white supremacy. We're challenging white supremacy. Right? <clears throat> this is how entrenched it is, how entrenched it is. Uh, 1968, Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. Martin Luther King went to Memphis, Tennessee for the purpose of uh, supporting the sanitation strike workers, right? And the sanitation strike workers, when they was on strike, they wore a body placard, right? A body placard, and it says what? I am a man. Why? They're fighting for workers' rights. Why would they have to put a body placard saying I am a man? Why do they have to identify themselves as I am a man? Because to the degree they've been dehumanized and degraded and devalued as a human being. Forty years later, what do we have? Hashtag what? Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. What happened? What changed? Black Lives Matter. The same argument. Telling the world Black Lives Matter. Who didn't know that? Who didn't know that? There's value in black lives. They knew it. When they exploit us, they enslave us, and they send us to the penitentiary. 
pennies on a dollar, making these over the profits, menial manual labor, exploitation. Huh? So my brother, when we talk about the division between the, the, the Democrat and Republicans, we gotta find a third way. Actually, I actually find a second way because most two are the same. <laughs> you know. Um, so build the people senate. That's my that's my answer to that question. Screw the Democratic and Republican Party. Cause they ain't never did us any good. All right, not about a fight. I don't care who's president, black, brown, or indifferent. Cause they adhere to the corporate entity from which they have allegiance to. All right? Remember, if you have allegiance to a corporation, keep that in mind. Every time you look at that flag, oh, that's the corporation. All right? Anybody else got a question? No? I have a, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could expound on how the People's Senate, how building the People's Senate can help connect people across the country, across Turtle Island, in, in the five, uh, battling against the five genocide charges that you mentioned, like environmental racism, mm -hmm. battling against state-sanctioned violence by the police who kill black, brown, and indigenous people with impunity. How, how we can unite better, build together better. For example, in Detroit, in the surrounding area, in the Midwestern region, and then, as you said, connecting across uh, the country. How, maybe just expound for a moment. Um, well, the, the, only, uh, the thing is about being, getting organized, uh, Sarah. Like getting organized. Once we're gonna find ourselves getting organized and we see a, a road map uh, towards uh, greater unity and uh, organizational development, that's what we're talking about. Because what we want to do, we're going to be able to call a, a mass and popular movement. A mass and popular movement. In my, I got a ch chapter in the book uh, dealing with mass and popular movement. And that's what the People's Senate is going to do. Right? That's the purpose of the People's Senate. Build a mass and popular movement. So each area is going to determine a particular issue right, that they feel is of national consequence. We'll bring those issues across the board, and then we'll make that as our platform or agenda. right? for us to organize towards. That way we are uniting our people with that is this common, that we have read upon is common to us in terms of this fight. Again, an example, mass incarceration. 13 forward. 13 forward challenges mass incarceration. Why, because they take the incentive for mass incarceration. Mass incarceration is what, what? They can make profits over pennies on a dollar. Free labor. So now we're saying, we're going to change the dynamics of the penal system so that the individuals going in prison, Ruffin versus Commonwealth, Supreme Court decision. All right, North Carolina versus, uh, 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 North Carolina Union versus, I can't even remember the prison, right? The courts say that prisoners are slaves of the state, black and white. That's the law. It's a prison penal system by law. So what we're saying, mass incarceration, was what you found to be genocide based upon the International Tribunal, 13 forward. That's our answer. All right? Take the incentive out. So now these prisoners, no longer we call prisoners, we call incarcerated workers. We're making them part of the working class. They're part of the working class. Right? And we're going to ensure that they receive at least the minimum wage for their labor. Take the incentive. Hey, hey. Now if you give a person in prison and job, a real job in prison, then you give them a person a real job in the streets. But not only that, but we're going to hook up the unions to these jobs. So an individual come out of penitentiary, go right into a union job. We change the mentality, the reality of what we call uh, transformative justice. We transform the system. Okay? And we challenge mass incarceration. We challenge the means of, of, of committing genocide against us. Right? So that's a national campaign, 13-4. Right? Universal health care, health inequities, one of the challenges. We must fight for universal health care. Part of the people's senate. One of the issues, 
across the country. Let's organize universal health care so, so we can challenge these health inequities that we're confronting right, in the health care system, the pharmaceutical death care system. Right? They ain't trying to keep us alive. They're trying, just trying to manage our death and get rich. That's right. They give you a pill and make you need to have another pill for that pill. Come on. That's designed. Come on, people. So mass incarceration all right, is another. And we'll allow the, you know, there's others, but we we'll want the people to come up forward and say, well, these are the issues we want to address and build a uh, national campaign and building the People's Center, building a popular, mass and popular movement in this country. We cannot win without it. We will not win without building a mass and popular movement. Okay. People are the motor force in creating history when they're organized, when they're inspired and motivated. Right? And that's what the People's Center is going to do. We're going to inspire and motivate people towards their own liberation, towards their own empowerment. Sarah? Thank you. If there's not any other questions, um, okay, one more, yes. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa I was going to ask if you had any uh, like key tactics that come to mind to, for one to deal with the stress or ways to keep your heart and head together with being like tapped in and awareness on one's own struggle so one could more presently and actively participate in their own liberation, mm. our, our liberation. Mm. Uh, I, I cannot answer that question without being, uh, 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 I cannot answer that question being impartial. I cannot. All right? I got to be partial about this. That's right. That's wrong. All right? If you want to, prayer. Let me put it that way. Just say prayer. All right? We have to tap into the universe. And I don't want to go all mystical and spiritual and religious and so forth and so on, but <clears throat> the human body is made up of atoms. The whole planet is made of atoms. This book, this coffee table, this, this made of atoms. What is this? The composition of those atoms. And there's a frequency, there's an energy there. Right? There's an energy there. We have to be able to tap into that energy, but you have to be conscious of the fact that that energy exists. Deliberately conscious of it. Right? And if you are, Perhaps you will tap into something divine. Right? That give you that solace. That give you that balance. Right? In terms of the struggle. For me, it was Islam. Right? And I don't profess to be the best Muslim. I am not. Right? Maybe I shouldn't say that because that might be sinful. Right? It's really my faults, okay? <laughs> but that's my foundation. Right? And there's many reasons why. I'll give you one. Um, for those of you who are Christian, right? Do you know the language of Jesus? What was the language of Jesus' language? Aramaic. Aramaic, right? Do you know the word of God in Aramaic is? Allah. Allah. In Judaism, Elohim. In Islam, Allah. It's only one God. Different names. Even in Islam, we have 99 attributes, right? But there's only one God, one divine. And if you don't believe in God, right? I've read books, you know, uh, anti dorn by Frederick Ingalls, right? If anybody read that, right? Hell of a book, right? Where he's refusing anti dorn spirituality and metaphysical uh, 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 philosophy, right? But let me just share one thing with you, right? Is this here? Physics tells us that energy never dies. It transforms and transmute. Right? Transforms and transmute. So the end of this entity that we call life, this energy flow, once it's gone, where does it go? Just dissipates into the ether? Maybe. I don't know. I made a Faustian uh, agreement when I became Muslim. Right? Like, be damned if you do, be damned if you don't. Right? All right. Because I recognize that that principle of physics, 
right? And so if there is an afterlife, right? Because I'm a good person by nature, I think, I hope, <laughs> right? Then perhaps I'll make it to that other place, you know what I mean? Consciously and deliberately, right? <clears throat> but if there's not, what do I lose? I don't lose anything. But if there is, I lost everything. Okay? That's the Faustian, Faustian agreement of promise, right? And so I accepted that as my, my path, okay? And to maintain my spiritual foundation so I can deal with this material world which we live in. Well, I hope I answered your question. Okay. Thank you. Can we, um, wow. Is there another? Okay. Thank you. Hey, black man. Peace. Hey, black man. Uh, I'm just going to sit down. <laughs> it's all respect. It's all no, hey, I'll sit down with you then. Okay. <laughs> Come on. Um, I was, well, first of all, uh, deep gratitude uh, for your vulnerability and your wisdom. Um, Being, there's nothing wrong with being human. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, that's much appreciated. <laughs> um, my name is Jabari Lane. I'm originally from New Haven, uh, Connecticut. Uh -huh. um, and I now live here in Detroit. Okay. My question is if you can speak on uh, the utility of petitioning the International Court of Justice mm. on. Um, our status as mm -hmm. prisoners of war, mm -hmm. um, and also the role of reparations in, in, the, in the movement. Good one. Good one. I appreciate the answer. I appreciate the question. <clears throat> um, international law permit us, first of all, to gauge in war, right? Those who oppress have the right, those who colonists have the right to free themselves from colonization, according to international law. I got it in the book. I'm not going to go and read it over from here, right? Um, so the international court, right? International bodies, we cannot go to them as individuals. Right? We gotta go to them as an organization, right? The United States, um, 18 U.S.C. 1091, is the United States federal law dealing with genocides, okay? They're in violation of their own laws. And so what we're preparing to do is file a lawsuit, all right, against their own laws. And we'll have the international community join in, particularly those who have suffered genocides, as by the results of the machinations of the United, United States to join in. And perhaps in this way, we might be able to get our petition with the joining of other international bodies into the, to the, uh, to the world court, right? Uh, we already got a judgment, you know, from an international body of the verdict of genocides. Now it's a question of building the campaign so we can have the support base to take our case to the world court, right? We don't have that kind of support base yet, right? Just the idea that the verdict has been rendered, it's not well known, okay? Our CCR had just filed a uh, petition uh, to the courts or a proposed petition to the courts dealing with the issue of genocide for, in Gaza and the United States complicity in that, right? That's a good format for us. Okay, and so uh, we have to build our case, build our campaign, both nationally and internationally, in order to have the, 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 the uh, status from which we can go to the world court. But it's, it's, in, it's, in, the, in, the, it's in the making, right? And the other question was? Reparations. Well, reparations. <laughs> Let me say this off the top. There is no reparation about the freedom of political prisoners, period. Will be no reparations without the freedom of our political prisoners. I right? want repair. Well, reparation means to repair, right? <clears throat> I also am under the impression that reparations, as part of our struggle, is to repair the trauma that we have confronted or have suffered as a people. All right. So we have to figure out the ways how to go through that process as well, 
in terms of reparations. Now, reparations for what? Just give people money? No, absolutely not. Right? In my book, I talk about reparations, and what did I say about? Give us military equipment to defend ourselves. Give us land so we can build our own nation. All right? That's reparations. That's real reparations. Okay? We have to fight for that. Okay? All right? well, we're building towards what we call New Africa. All right? All right? We're going to build New Africa. We have to. We have to remove ourselves from this system. All right? Particularly if people who are adhering to the idea of supremacy won't change. If they don't change, we got to get out the way. All right? We have to remove ourselves from harm. And so one of the process of doing so is what we were trying to do back in 1863 to 1865, right? Building our own nation. Uh, at least in 1867 when they decided they're going to make us second-class citizens. Okay? So that's the golden objective. Reparations means everything that entails building a new nation. All right? That's what all other nations do when they ask for reparations. Not all, but many, okay, nations. They gave reparations to the Japanese. All right? If anybody owed in their reparations, it's definitely us. Okay? So yeah, we're gonna demand reparations as part of the movement, but in terms of how that's gonna look, what that's gonna look like, we just got some issues that we have to address. Right? And nation building is what we need to do in terms of that process. All right? Yeah. Any more questions? If you don't know any questions, I wanna thank you guys for coming out and hearing this old man talk about 